There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. I'm going to be talking about the impact of a generous heart. And I know some people think, well, you know, I, I've got so many things that are calling for my finances. I've got rent to pay. I've got a house payment. I've got to put my kids through school. And the church wants my money too. Why should I be generous toward the things of God? You are going to be amazed at the answer. When you hear it, you won't be able to help yourself from being generous. The impact of a generous heart. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the impact of a generous heart. And as I prayed throughout the week, I just kept coming back to this and back to this. I just felt like it was what I was supposed to share tonight. And as we look in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, we're going to see the people that have been set forth as an example or a precedent of having a generous heart. In chapter 9, we're going to see the produce, or what having a generous heart produces. In chapter 10, we're going to see the possibility that is created through generosity. In chapter 11, we're going to look at the problem that the Apostle Paul associated with his sequential teaching here on having a generous heart. And then finally, we're going to end by talking about the promise that is given to the consistently generous. All right, let's talk about the people. A group of people that were set forth as an example of being generous hearted. Here Paul is endeavoring to encourage the Corinthian church to follow through on an offering they had promised to give. Up to this point, it's just been all talk with them. And so Paul talks about a group of believers in Macedonia sets them up as an example. Let's read beginning in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 8 and 1. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. It's an interesting group of people here that were just radically sold out to what God was doing through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. A woman named Lydia, her family, an old Roman soldier, and his family. And I like to believe that demon-possessed girl that got set free gave her heart to Christ. Those are the Macedonians that, that Paul is telling the Corinthians, Listen, you need to understand about the grace of God that was operation, in operation in their lives. They're going through the roughest patch you can imagine. And they were extravagantly generous. In fact, he said, they implored me, and they urged me to receive the gift. Interesting, it wasn't the minister doing the imploring to get people to give. It was the people imploring the minister to receive a gift. And it said, you know, that there was urgency. I love that. In, in verse 4, look again, imploring us with much urgency. Everyone say urgency. Why were they so urgent? Because they had come to personally, personally realize that life was short, eternity was long, heaven was real, and hell was very hot. Now they also realized that someone paid Paul's way to bring the gospel to them. Paul and Silas only came because someone had supported them in their endeavors. And if they hadn't come, these people would still be lost and headed for a Christless eternity. And now they realize, hey, it's our turn. It's our turn. 
We have found out what life is really all about. We found out what eternity is really all about. We realize why we're on the planet. We have been brought into contact with our creator. And the least we can do now is support them while they bring this good news to other people as well. And so their giving was liberal, even sacrificial, because of what Christ had done in their life. And then the second thing, we look in chapter 9, and I'm just going to share a thought or so from each chapter. We look at the produce, or what a generous heart produces. Look with me in chapter 9 and verse 5, if you would. Paul's writing, he says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Friend, when you give, is it a grudging obligation or is it a matter of generosity? There's a huge difference between the two. Our serving, our giving, our praying, everything we do ought to be a matter of generosity, not a grudging obligation. Verse 6, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Now, in talking about giving, Paul uses this analogy. He said it's like sowing seeds, and it does produce something. There, there is a blessing attached with it. If you sow sparingly, that's the way you reap. If you give generously, if you give out of the right kind of a heart, it comes back to you the same way. God's able to meet all of your needs and give you a surplus beyond that so that you can give to others and help them. You know, I got saved out of a background of some pretty severe drug addiction. I was a mess when I got saved. Got saved in a street mission filled with derelicts, homeless people, and drug addicts, among whom I was chief at the time. I was so radically transformed. And I remember I would go to these meetings in what they called Grange Halls, these little halls they had in different places in Oregon, and, and listen to preaching. And I would go to this little church, and it, you know they took up an offering, and I thought, what a marvelous idea. I want other people to have what I have. And I literally gave everything I had away. I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. Nobody told me. I, I needed a little bit of growth in the wisdom side. When I ran out of money, I gave all my stuff away. I still remember the offering when I put my hunting knife in there. I had an 18-inch long hunting knife put in the offering basket. You should have seen it go down the aisle. <laughs> but I think that's normal from a heart that's been changed by Jesus, just like these Macedonians. And I remember one night, I was at one of those meetings. In fact, I'll never forget this. They were going to receive an offering. It was an evangelist was there teaching, and then he would take the gospel to other places, and he said, look, just pray and do whatever God lays on your heart to do. So I closed my eyes, and I earnestly prayed, and I had a vision. And in this vision, I saw a $10 bill that was actually folded up in a little small triangle so you could just see the 10 on it. It was the oddest thing. I thought, wow. And I pulled my wallet out, and I didn't have a $10 bill in there. I thought, how weird. I, I just made a choice, and I, I gave something else. I actually gave more than that that night. But I thought that was the weirdest thing. I had a definite vision. Well, the next day, I'm driving in my van. I got a couple Christian friends in there. We stop at this crosswalk. There's people walking across, and something flipped in the street, and it caught the corner of my eye. I told one of the guys, I said, get out. I said, I saw something move over there in the street. Go see what that is. He goes over there, picks something up, comes back, gets in my van, sits in the seat next to me. He said, look at this. Isn't this weird? It was a $10 bill folded up in a little tiny triangle with just the 10 showing. <laughs> to me, it was epic. To me, it was one of those things where David said, God, show me a token for good. 
God had shown me that in connection with an offering and supporting the gospel, and it spoke loud and clear to me. God was saying, listen, you support my gospel, and you obey me, and I will take care of you, Bayless. You will never have to worry about your needs being met. I remember reading about a guy named Charlie Page. He was homeless at the time, was penniless, didn't even have money for food, and stopped outside to hear a Salvation Army band play, and they were ministering and preaching, and then they passed the tambourine. And when the tambourine came to him, he told the girl, he said, I don't have any money at all. I don't even have money for food. She gave him a dollar's worth of change and said, listen, you take 10 cents of that and you put it back in the offering plate. And from this day forward, if you will give 10% of everything that comes to you, you will never be penniless again. So Charlie did that. He put a dime back in. And from that day forward, anything that came to him, he would give 10% to the church. Pretty soon he got a job and he continued to tithe. That's what tithing is, giving God the first tenth of everything you get. In fact, the Bible says the tithe is holy. It belongs to the Lord. And Charlie did that. He went on to prosper. And actually, this is many years ago, but became a millionaire. In the day, there were very few millionaires. He built several hospitals. He put a fortune into the gospel to send the gospel around the world. And he attributed all to the lesson he learned from that little Salvation Army girl that day to be generous and to put God's kingdom first. And that's what Paul is saying here. Look, if you sow bountifully, it'll come back to you the same way. That there, there is something produced through our giving. And not just that. Look at verse 9. As it is written, he's dispersed abroad. He's given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seeds you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now that's interesting. It says God supplies two things. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Now in the context, seed is talking about the gifts they were giving. So God supplies two things. Everybody say seed for the sower, seed for the sower. bread for food. All right, the bread comes from the seed as well. It's, 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 you know, processed in bread. In other words, God provides for us something to give and something to consume for ourselves. Those are the two things that God supplies. He supplies seed for us to sow, and God supplies something for us that we consume upon ourselves, we use for our own needs, for our own desires. Two things he supplies. Seed to give, bread for food. But what a lot of people do is the seed that God supplies to sow, they put it in this pile over here and they consume it all. You have two things right now that God has given you. Some of what you have is seed to sow. Some of it should be consumed upon your own needs. You need to determine which is which because God only multiplies one. Now may the Lord multiply the seed you've sown. It doesn't say that he supplies the bread for, that he multiplies the bread for food. God only multiplies the seed we sow. So what is it that you have in your life right now that is seed to sow? Have you ever thought about it? Or is everything just, well, okay, I got this, and so I'm going to consume this, and if I got anything left over, maybe I'll think about church, maybe I'll think about the kingdom, maybe I'll think about missions. No, God has supplied seed to sow and bread for food. Let's read on, verses 11 and 12 says, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. So there's two more things that, the, that having a generous heart produces. It produces thanksgiving and glory to God, and it supplies needs. And as people's needs are met, as their spiritual needs are met through the preaching of the gospel, as material needs are met, as, as people's needs will be met through the build-a-bag that we're doing, 
you know, to take out during this, this particular season to families in need. God will be glorified. And then we come to the possibility, and that's in chapter 10. That deals with the sphere of our influence, the possibility. Chapter 10, and look in verse 13, if you would. Paul's thoughts, they're progressive. He hasn't changed the subject yet. He said, we, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. And what he's speaking of here is a field of labor with definite limitations. Paul said, all right, you're within the sphere that God's given us. The, the, the sphere of influence he's given us, it reaches you. You see, no one can be it all. No one can do it all. As an individual, I've got some gifts or some things. It's quite apparent that I don't have those gifts. I can't do everything. I can't be everywhere. As a church, we cannot do everything. We cannot be everywhere. God has given us a sphere of influence. He's given us a particular field that he's called us to work in, and he's given us specific assignments. He's talking about boundaries appointed by God. Let's read on, verse 14. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority did not extend to you. For it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. Now, as their faith is increased and they give generously, that is what the context is about. The sphere of influence is increased. I want you to listen to me. In verse 13, God appoints a particular field, a particular sphere of influence, but he works through the willingness of his people to give to increase that sphere of influence. God has allotted us something we can do as a church. God says, okay, there you go. However, I am willing to extend that sphere. I'm willing to extend those borders and those boundaries according to the faith of the people. According to their willingness to get involved, I'm going to extend that sphere. How amazing is that? What, what, what an opportunity, what a possibility. How many think it would be good if we did more than we're doing in local outreach? And we do a lot, but I'd love to do so much more. Grateful Hearts is just one of the, the outreaches that Cottonwood is so involved in, feeds some 50, 60,000 people every year. We've got tons of other local outreaches. We're on television around the world. We're using social media in different ways. We've got teams that are, in fact, I think we just had a team that went out to India. I don't even know if they're back, and I got a little thing, don't remember who it was. Another team was going out somewhere. We have another team that's going out to Myanmar. We're sending out teams all the time. Man, I would like to see that increase. I would like to have a greater impact. God says, okay, I've given you a sphere. Be faithful to work in it, and I'll increase it as your faith increases. You know, the Bible says of Abel that Abel, by faith, gave God his first and his best. It takes faith to give God the first and the best. When you have no guarantee other than his promise to guide, sustain, and bless you, when you don't know what's coming in the future. But Paul said, I've got hope that as your faith increases, our sphere will increase as well, and we can take the gospel to regions beyond. And then we come to the problem. Everyone say the problem. Paul talks about a problem connected with his teaching on generosity. In chapter 11, verse 7, he said, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, 
I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia, the Philippian jailer, Lydia, a seller of purple, that demon-possessed girl, the believers in Macedonia, they supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, so I will keep myself. When Paul went to Corinth, he never took an offering from them. And he said, did I commit sin in doing this? The Amplify Bible, Paul puts it this way. Did I perhaps make a mistake and do you a wrong? He said, I robbed other churches. The Macedonians supplied his need and gave so the work in Corinth could continue. And Paul's thoughts here are progressive on this point. He answers his own question in chapter 12. Look with me if you would. Verse 13. Did I make a mistake? Chapter 12, verse 13. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. He said, I was wrong. He did them a disservice. And because of that, he said, I made you inferior to other churches. It's an interesting word. This word inferior, it's only used two other times in the entire New Testament. It means to be treated worse than, to experience loss, to be subdued, to be enslaved, or to be controlled by. So by not extending to them the privilege to give, and by not teaching them their responsibility to give, Paul said, I did you wrong, and I put you in a position to be subdued or controlled. And the question is what? To be controlled, to be subdued by what? By the world system. Friend, you can operate by the natural laws and principles of this world, and you can prosper to a degree. You can put, you know, business acumen to work, and, and you can prosper if you'll just follow some natural laws. But then you are subject, and listen to me, you are subject to the fluctuations or downturns in the economy. You're subject to recession. You're subject to economic collapse. You're subject to the whim of the government. You're subject to the decisions of the company you work for. You're subject to the rising or falling of whatever industry you work in. But when you give generously and consistently, it opens the door for you to participate in a higher system. Which now we come to the promise, and I'm just about done. Look with me in Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians in the fourth chapter. The promise. These are the very people that Paul was holding up to the Corinthians as an example. How did you understand what I just shared with you? Did that make sense? I just want to make sure you, you got it. You're really quiet tonight. I'm not quite sure why. I'm going to say it again. I just want to make sure you got it. Paul said, listen, when I came to you guys, I didn't take up an offering. I didn't talk about it at all. I didn't want to be a burden to anybody. But maybe I did you a disservice. Maybe I was wrong in that. And then a little while later in this letter, he writes them. He says, it was wrong. It was wrong. And I put you in a, a place of, of being inferior to other churches into a position of being subdued or controlled by not teaching you the responsibility and the privilege to give and to support the gospel. Philippians chapter 4, here's the promise. Verse 15, written to that church in Philippi, to that grizzled old jailer and his family, to Lydia who sold purple to her family, I think to that demon-possessed girl that got saved. And he said this in verse 15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Look in verse Back to verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Verse 18, indeed I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, 
an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Verse 19, the verse that everybody knows, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We cannot divert, divorce verse 19 from verse 18, verse 17, verse 16, and verse 15. They had given consistently and repeatedly as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. They had supported the gospel going around the world. And Paul said, because of that, my God will supply all of your need, not according to an earthly standard. It doesn't matter to God what happens with the economy. It doesn't matter to God what happens with the industry that you work in. It doesn't matter to God what decisions the company you work for makes. It doesn't matter to God the the whims of the government. Because God will supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, by a heavenly standard, not according to an earthly economy. You see, friend, God can open doors of favor and opportunity that otherwise would remain shut. He will guide you by His Spirit and work miracles where necessary. You know, one of the most amazing things about God is His consistency. His mercies are new every morning. He daily loads us down with benefits. And when we endeavor to be like Him, and we should be, we'll be consistent as well. And when we are consistent in our generosity, we will reap the blessing in a consistent way. So I want to encourage you not just to start being generous, but continue on in your generosity. You will reap if you do not faint. Be generous. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org. One person catches the vision. Others join in. The objective is huge. As others are included, using their gifts and influence, good progress can be made together. In the church, there is only steady and lasting progress as each generation builds up, supports, and encourages the next. In his book, From Generation to Generation, Bayless Conley outlines the role, responsibility, and opportunity each generation has to connect and build God's church together. Glean from Bayless's experience and practical advice. Use the information on the screen now to order your copy of From Generation to Generation.